And uh, hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to show you how we can speed up the internet routing convergence. <laughs> so every day in the internet, there are uh, network outages. And those outages, they directly affect users' connectivity. So clearly, as a network operator, one of your goals is, your, is, is to prevent connectivity disruptions upon such kind of outages. But uh, this is challenging uh, because, uh, as an illustration, this is the IS level topology in 2015. And in this uh, very large graph, there can be a failure anywhere, at any time, and affecting any user. So if you imagine that this is a network here, the first thing that you can have is a failure inside your network, a local failure. But you can also have failure uh, outside, your outside your network in other networks that you do not control. And those failures can also affect your user's connectivity. So the good news is that for local failures, uh, many techniques have been designed already, and they enable uh, quick uh, traffic restoration when there is a failure. And uh, here, basically, they rely on two key ingredients. First, uh, they can quickly uh, detect failures using, for instance, hardware-generated signals. And then they can quickly reroute traffic, for instance, using prefix independent convergence or MPLS fast reroute. The problem, though, is that for remote failures, there is no other way than waiting the internet to converge in order to restore connectivity. And the internet converges very, very slowly. Many papers have illustrated the slow internet convergence already. And today, I'm going to show it one more time. This time with an example, this example here, uh, which is an outage which happened in the Time Warner Cable Network in 2014. And for this example, what we did is uh, we took all the BGP peers from uh, RIPE, RIS, and RAD views, and we computed for each of them the time difference between the actual outage in the Time Warner Cable Network and the time where each BGP peer received the first withdrawal for the Time Warner Cable Network after the outage. So this gives us a CDF over all the peers. And here you can see that it takes more than 100 seconds for half of the BGP peers just to receive the first withdrawal, right? So this is clearly a very long time doing which uh, traffic can be lost. And by the way, we also looked at the time difference between uh, the outage and the last BGP withdrawal that each uh, peer uh, receives here. And it takes five up to 10 minutes. So clearly, the internet converged slowly. So the conclusion here is that control plane-based techniques, and here more particularly BGP-based techniques, are slow to converge upon remote outages. So because they are slow to converge, what about using data plane signals instead for fast rerouting? Well, this is what I will show you today. Today, I will show you Blink. Blink is a fast connectivity recovery system which uses those data plane signals in order to quickly reroute traffic upon remote failures. So in this talk, first I will uh, show you why and how uh, we should use data plane signals for fast rerouting. Then I will show you that Blink can quickly infer failure with good accuracy and often within one second. Then I will show you that Blink quickly reroutes traffic and this working backup path. And finally, I will show you that Blink works in practice and on existing devices. OK, so let's first see why and how we should use data plane signals for fast rerouting. So by data plane signals here, I mean TCP flows. And why TCP flows? Because they all exhibit the same behavior when there is a failure. So if you consider here a source and a destination, and the source is sending TCP packets to the destination with an increasing sequence number, now imagine that there is a failure. So what happens in this case is that the source is likely to send new packets because it has space, space in its congestion window. And every time the source sends a new packet, it also uh, activates the, the retransmission timeout, which is computed with the round trip time. And here, basically, uh, if the source here doesn't receive any acknowledgment, it will eventually uh, the, the retransmission timer, so it will eventually expire, triggering the source to retransmit the first unacknowledged packet, and this again and again, following an exponential backoff. Right? So 
this behavior is shared between all the TCP flows, which means that when multiple flows are all affected by the same failure, what we have is a kind of a wave of retransmissions. So to illustrate this a little bit more, what we did is uh, we simulated a failure affecting 100,000 flows using the NS3 simulator. And here, by the way, we use the same RTT distribution than the one we have observed in uh, Kaida Trace because the RTT is an important parameter as it is used to compute this retransmission timeout. Here is the number of retransmissions over time and across all the 100,000 flows. And here in this case, we simulated the failure at second one. And you can see that quickly after the failure, we see the first retransmissions, right? And then the second retransmissions, and then the third one, and the fourth one, and so on. So here you can see that the signal has a very high amplitude and quickly after the, the failure. And this behavior is always happen uh, when there is several TCP flows that are all affected by the same failure. So now we'll show you how Blink uh, leverages this, this signal in order to accurately infer failure and often within one second only. So to detect failures, Blink looks at TCP retransmissions. The problem is that TCP retransmissions, they can be completely unrelated to any failure. Right? For instance, if you consider this very simple example where you have the number of retransmissions over time, well, maybe the first peak here is just caused by congestions. And maybe the second one here is just one bogus flow that is sending lots of retransmissions and all the other ones are perfectly fine. And maybe finally, this is an actual failure in, in which case we want to reroute traffic. Well, Blink need to distinguish between failures and noise and this entirely in the data plane. So this is clearly one challenge. So how uh, Blink uh, deals with this? Well, first it looks at consecutive packets with the same sequence number. And why it does it? Because remember that whenever the source starts to retransmit packets, the retransmissions, they are all consecutive and they have the same sequence number, right? Which is, by the way, not always the case when you have congestions. When you have congestions, you can have a new packet between two retransmissions, right? Then what does Blink do? It, uh, it also monitors uh, the number of flows experiencing retransmissions over time, and it does it using a sliding window. So here I want to emphasize that Blink monitors the number of flows experiencing retransmissions and not the actual number of retransmissions, such that if there is just one flow with lots of retransmissions, this flow will just count as one. Okay, so now if we take our previous example here on the top and we apply our new strategy here on the bottom, what we have is that we will not detect congestions and bogus flows anymore, but we will detect the failure here. And by the way, there is an important parameter here, which is the duration of the sliding window. So here we picked 800 milliseconds because it's enough to see the first few retransmissions that are caused by the failure, but it's still a very short uh, uh, period of time such that we don't get too much noise. So Blink, is intended to run in programmable switches. The problem is that those switches, they have very limited amount of resources. So for instance, there is a limited amount of memory we can use, and there is a limited amount of operations we can do per packet. So how does Blink deal with this? Well, clearly Blink cannot monitor all the 700,000 prefixes that are advertised in the internet. So what does it do? Then it just focuses on the most popular ones, the one that attracts data traffic. And this kind, this kind of makes sense because as a data-driven system, Blink needs data traffic to work. So that kind of makes sense. But actually there is a good news here is that we know the internet traffic follows a zip uh, distribution. So basically by doing this, Blink is able to, to, to cover uh, the vast majority of the internet traffic. But clearly, for a given monitored prefix, Blink cannot monitor all the flows that are being forwarded to that prefix. So what does it do? It will just monitor a sample of the flows. And uh, here, what one challenge is that Blink needs to monitor uh, active flows, the flows that are sending packets and that will send retransmissions if there is a failure, right? We don't want Blink to monitor inactive flows. So here, more precisely, Blink will monitor uh, 64 
by default, active flows per prefix. Why 64? Because I will show you later, it's a sample which is large enough to detect failures, but it's still, it's still a relatively low number, uh, such that we don't use a lot of resources for each prefix monitored. But then, how can Blink monitor active flows? Well, basically here the strategy is that it evicts a flow from the sample whenever that flow doesn't send the packet for a given time. And here the given time is two seconds because it's enough, again, to see the first few retransmissions if there is a failure, but it's still relatively short such that an inactive flow gets quickly evicted. And then basically when Blink evicts a flow, it can select a new one and it does it in a first seen, first selected manner. So this is pretty simple, but I will show you that in practice it works well. Okay, so finally, Blink infers a failure whenever the majority of the monitored flows for a given prefix experience retransmissions. So if we take our previous example here, whenever we are above this line, 32, which is half of 64, Blink infers a failure. Okay, so let's now evaluate um, this, uh, this algorithm that Blink is using to detect failure. And here what we did is that we used 15 real traces, 13 from Kaida, and two from Maui, and altogether, they cover a total of almost 16 hours of data traffic. So here, we are mainly interested in two things. First, the accuracy, so true positive rate against false positive rate, and the speed. How long does Blink take to infer failures? But the problem is that we do not have grand truth on those real traces. We don't know when there is a failure and when there is no failure. So what we did here is that we extracted uh, the characteristics of those real traces, and then we, uh, we did uh, synthetic traces that follow uh, the traffic characteristics that we extracted from those real traces. So more precisely here, we extracted the round trip time, the packet rate, the flow duration for each real trace, and then we used the NS3 simulator in order to replay these flows, and then we simulated failures. Then we collected the resulting traces, and we ran our Python-based implementation of Blink on them. OK? So this is the accuracy of, of Blink. So on the x-axis here, you have each real trace that we used uh, here to test Blink. So it's, it's, uh, we, 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 here, uh, we show the result per real trace because each real trace has a different traffic patterns. For instance, a different LTT distribution or a different uh, proportion of active flows versus inactive flows. On the y-axis, we have the true positive rate, which is just the ratio between the number of times Blink uh, inferred the failure with the number of failures that we actually simulated in, uh, uh, with NS3. Okay, and here are the results. So you can see that we are very often above 80% uh, accuracy here. Uh, the best case here is 94%, and the worst case is still 65%, which is still relatively good, uh, would still uh, make Blink uh, efficient, even in this case. Okay, so then what about the false positive rates? So here we did synthetic traces again, but instead of uh, simulating failures, we simulated random packet loss from 1% to 9%. And then we computed this false positive rate. And well, it turns out that below 4% of packet loss, Blink never inferred any failure. So this is definitely a good sign because generally in the internet, and I will confirm this later by the way, but generally, we have less than 4% of packet loss, right? Which means that uh, in practice, Blink uh, is likely not to have a lot of false positives. Okay, so finally, what about the speed? So here what we did is we took the synthetic traces again with the failure, and this time we just uh, uh, measured the time it takes for Blink to infer failures. Well, it turns out that for uh, most of the traffic traces, Blink is able to uh, infer failures within a second as you can see here. And even in the worst cases here, which are, about, which are between six and eight seconds, it's still faster than BGP, right? So clearly we are faster than BGP by far. Okay, so now I will uh, show you that Blink uh, can quickly uh, reroute traffic into working backup path. So when Blink uh, detects a failure, it then immediately activates uh, backup paths that are pre-populated by the control plane. So here the backup paths are pre-populated by the control plane prior to the failure, right? But upon the failure, everything is done entirely in the data plane. 
But because everything is done in the data plane, Blink cannot prevent some forwarding issues. And I will just illustrate, the, illustrate this with this example here, where, for instance, we deploy Blink in one of our border routers here, and we have three possible next steps. So initially, the traffic is using the bottom path because IS1 is our primary next step. And now imagine that there is a failure in IS4, for instance. So it's a remote failure, and Blink is likely to detect that failure, and will then reroute traffic to IS2, which is our preferred backup next step. The problem here is that IS2 is also affected by the failure. So we will have a black hole, right? The connectivity will not be restored. Worse, uh, maybe IS2 has also detected the failure and will, uh, will uh, reroute the traffic back to the Blink node, in which case we would have a forwarding loop. Well, the good news is that as for failures, Blink uh, uses data plane signals in order to assess whether a next stop is working, and then it picks a working one. Okay, so more precisely, how does it work? When Blink detects the failure, it then, it then sends half of the monitored flows to each backup next stop, IS2 and IS3 here. All the non-monitored flows, they first go to the first backup next stop, which is IS2. And then basically here, Blink will use those flows in order to assess whether a next stop is working. So here, for instance, it will realize that IS2 is not working, and it will then send all the traffic to IS3, which, which will restore connectivity. Okay. So then how does Blink uh, detect uh, loops and black holes? Well, basically, as for failures, it look at consecutive packets with the same sequence number. And why? Because when you have a black hole, make it basically the flows they will continue to send retransmissions, right? And when you have a loop, basically you will see the same packets again and again and very, very often, right? Because they are looping. So this is basically what we use here. Uh, we use the same algorithm than before, basically. Okay, so finally, I will show you that Blink uh, works in practice and is deployable on existing devices. So what we did is that we actually run Blink on the 15 real traces, even though we don't have the ground truth, we still run it on the 15 real traces. And we, uh, we found that it detected six outages. So then we investigated each of these outages, and we found that for each of them, at least 42% of all the flows, all the flows, not just the 64, right, all of them, were experiencing retransmissions during a very short period of time. So this clearly means that something wrong was going on for each of those cases, and it's clearly fine to rewrite traffic, right? So those cases are likely not false positive. So then we expect uh, Blink to work for uh, at least 10K prefixes. And why? Because we designed Blink such that uh, it uses memory linearly with the number of prefixes it monitors. So if Blink monitors one prefix, it uses approximately 6,400 bits. If it monitors 10K prefixes, it needs around eight megabytes of memory, which is what current programmable uh, devices uh, have in general. So we expect Blink to work for at least 10K prefixes. Okay, so finally we tried Blink in our lab. So we had this uh, Tofino switch here, which, uh, which was connected to two servers, uh, a source and a destination. And then we just uh, failed the link between the Tofino switch and the destination server, and we measured uh, how long uh, the Tofino switch uh, takes to uh, restore connectivity via a backup link. So here is the result. So, on the, so this is the number of packets over time. And here you can clearly see the downtime that is <coughs> induced by the failure. And you can see that Blink, uh, and like here this Tofino switch, was able to restore connectivity within 1.1 second only, which is clearly faster than BGP. Okay, so this concludes my presentation. So I just showed you uh, Blink. Blink uh, infers failure uh, from data plane signals uh, with good accuracy and often within one second. Blink uh, then reroutes traffic to working backup path. And finally, uh, Blink uh, works in practice and on existing devices. For more information, you can visit our website. We have uh, the source code which is available. We have a VM that you can uh, use to run Blink. And uh, this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dave. Hi, Dave Oran, Network Systems Packet Design. Uh, I have two questions you can answer, one or both or neither. Uh, <laughs> first question is, um, doesn't this open a gigantic DDoS attack whereby 
an attacker can simulate retransmissions and force traffic to lots of places and can just back up links. And then the second question is, what happens when everybody switches to quick? OK, uh, so first, the, the, the first question. Uh, so clearly, uh, the security aspect is clearly a very good point. And uh, clearly, if you're an attacker, you could uh, generate data traffic, then generate retransmissions, and possibly like triggering the rerouting, right? But there are, there are things that first, uh, it's, it, it's, it's important to, to, to note before is, uh, First, Blink focuses on important uh, prefixes. So if you want to trick the system, you would have to generate a lot of traffic, right? Like, for that's, instance. That's what DDoS attacks do. Yeah, OK. But OK, <laughs> so, okay, but, uh, so that's the first thing. And, but then we already thought about some countermeasures or how you can protect Blink against such kind of attack. And for instance, um, we are working on this. But for instance, you know, we monitor those flows. Just by simply evicting even active flows, even if they are, uh, even if they are acting, if, if we evict them, right, then that would clearly make an attack uh, much harder because as an attacker, you don't know when your flow uh, are selected, and and then you would have a very short time budget to do the attack. So, yeah. So that's uh, so. What I'm saying is that clearly it's a it's a very good point, but I think that there are countermeasures to, uh, yeah, that, that we can used to, to prevent such kind of attacks, yeah. And what happens when everybody goes with quick and the sequence numbers are encrypted? Uh, sorry, can you just uh, repeat? What happens when everybody switches to quick and the sequence oh, numbers yeah. are encrypted? Yeah, yeah. so clearly, uh, if uh, all the traffic is encrypted, then, well, Blink wouldn't work. Uh, but the thing is that we don't need uh, a lot of portion of the traffic to be TCP. We just need, a, like, a small portion of the traffic uh, to be TCP in order for Blink to work. So even if uh, Blink, if the, the if, if the usage of Blink is increasing over time, as long as there, in, there is a small portion of TCP traffic, then Blink uh, should be able to work because simply because we just need 64 flows per prefix uh, in order to detect failures. Sorry, question. Uh, Christina Anita Rotaru, Northeastern University. Um, I would like to follow up on that question. Uh, and actually, you don't need a lot of traffic to make uh, the impression of a failure. There was a paper, actually several, but there was a paper in NDSS where you can show how to attack congestion control in a very smart way. Um, so again, going back to, uh, I, I think in general, it's a bad idea to rely on completely uh, unsecure or an unsecure protocol where actually there is no trust about the data. To, you, re, you rely on that information to make fundamental decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so just, yeah, just I mean, commenting is that you don't need a lot of data. Okay, no, you just need a few packets sure. that are placed at the right time. So we are aware that security is definitely one, uh, one possible problem. And we are currently still working on this. Um, well, again, for the same reason than before, uh, right? You need at least half of the flows that gets monitored as an attacker in order to trick the system, right? In order yeah. To, so just, right. just I don't want to monopolize, okay, yeah. but one one way to approach this is when you're looking at your evaluation, you should take or you should think that some of that data it's not trusted. And so what is the impact on, on your evaluation when, because the internet is adversarial. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. So you cannot just test on very nice data that, yeah, it works here. In reality, that's not going to be the case. Because when an attacker knows what you're doing, then that is going to attack, right? So you have to expect that an attacker is going to look after the, weakness, the weakest point in your system design. So that's all I want to say. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, let's thank Thomas.